And keep in mind, they didn't tell us the background rates there beforehand. I'm sorry, what? Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at one of Kyle Hill's videos called Should Fukushima Release Radioactive Water? Now if you do recall, I remember putting out a short about this topic and the short version of that short is, yes, turns out it's not that radioactive. But let's see what Kyle has to say. Over 100,000 buildings would be destroyed and over 19,000 people would be missing or dead. Again, people seem to forget that a lot of people when they think of the tsunami, they think of just the nuclear accident, whereas this was horrific. 19,000 people presumed dead is just horrific. It was the single greatest loss of life Japan had suffered since nuclear bombs flattened Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Beset by walls of water of the exact height numerous reports warned of, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant drowned. It lost power, then backup power, then the ability to adequately cool nuclear fuel. If you want to hear me talk a lot more about the accident itself for Fukushima, please check out my reaction to The Days, a uh, Netflix miniseries on Fukushima. I'll uh, pin a link to that in a comment below. The mitigation of the Fukushima nuclear disaster continues 10 years on. Thousands of tons of radioactive topsoil still sit in innumerable black bags stacked in pyramids on rural roads. Thousands of workers still move in and out of the power plant, cleaning, maintaining, and decommissioning. Decommissioning and cleanup after an accident is a huge amount of work and a long endeavor. Even though this happened well over 10 years ago, it, it takes a while to move the affected, the affected contaminated dirt, do constant um, po post-accident environmental assessments, uh, do dose assessments, contamination assessments, it's, it's a mess. Most globally relevant, however, is the recently approved plan to release stored radioactive water back into the ocean. That started just a few days ago and will continue for anywhere from seven to 40 years. Both the power and potential danger of nuclear fuel is that in the right configuration, it heats itself up. In a functional power plant, Rods filled with uranium pellets, moderated by both water and reaction-killing control rods, emit high-energy particles that cause nearby rods to do the same. Precisely controlled, this process generates an enormous amount of heat. So Fukushima is a boiling water reactor. He mentions uh, moderated by control rods, and that's true. Uh, control rods, you can think of it as the operator's accelerator for the, uh, for the reactor itself. Though, they're not the only things that affect reactor power. Um, for a boiling water reactor, the void coefficient is actually a significant portion since, as the name implies, the reactor vessel boiling does occur, which is different than the pressurized water reactor that I worked in. But the void coefficient, now in this case, it's, it's negative for a boiling water reactor. So you increase the amount of steam, add more heat into the reactor, increases the amount of steam, power goes down so it has a negative feedback loop and the term negative feedback is good because that means it's controlled it has a tendency to slow itself down to a maximum if you will and that's another reason why this wasn't nearly as bad as Chernobyl because Chernobyl had a positive void coefficient so that was another source of instability associated with the crazy test that they did. But this was a completely different scenario. I mean, another thing is right there where it says reactor building, it's a true containment structure resistant to even the sort of explosion that they would have had at the, at the Chernobyl building. We're dealing with a much better design than, than Chernobyl, but like all designs, it's not without flaws. Which the reactor uses to boil water, turn turbines, and ultimately generate electricity. This happens safely every day all over the world. In the ruins of Fukushima Daiichi's reactors, however, heat is still being produced by melted fuel, 
and radiation rates prevent any kind of fine grain control. Water is therefore constantly pumped through the reactors to prevent another meltdown. That water inevitably mixes with the corium and other debris and becomes radioactive itself. He's talking about decay heat, so fission products will still emit heat. Now the reactor is shut down, as shut down as can be. The reactors were shut down immediately during the accident, but the fission products still generate heat. What, at, at this point, way less than 1% of reactor power, probably less than 0.001% because we're, we're talking 10 years down the line plus, but that's still enough that you need to, that you need to keep it cool. And then there's corium he mentions, which is this goofy term of a melted mess of damaged fuel, the fuel cladding, and even parts of the reactor vessel and reactor coolant system. There's no straight term for corium, but it's something that occurs when you have an, when you have an accident. There have been times that people have actually made it on purpose in a controlled laboratory environment. Never been part of those. But yeah, when you have corium in your reactor, that's not a good thing. For the last decade, all of this contaminated water has been stored on site at Daiichi in giant tanks that now take up the vast majority of the plant's square footage. That is a lot of water. Now, uh, liquid waste is processed normally within tanks, but uh, let me see, tanks that size, those are huge, huge tanks. At the nuclear power plant that I worked at with two units, and each unit was individual than, was individually larger than an individual unit at Fukushima. The, the station was smaller than Fukushima overall because it was just two as opposed to six. One of those would probably accommodate for all of the liquid waste associated with normal shutdown, getting ready for a refueling outage. And this is a lot of that. But there's the difference between your normal shutdown and your post-accident cleanup that's been going on for over a decade now. And as of this year, they that's started running out of room. The cooling of Daiichi's ruins creates 130 to 150 cubic meters, 150,000 kilograms of contaminated cooling water, rainwater, and groundwater every single day. Japanese and international Best. experts have determined that building more and more on-site storage is not a viable long-term solution, and so a plan was proposed to release processed water back into the sea like every other similarly situated nuclear power plant does as a part of daily operations. Yep, liquid waste, uh, so a few things you can do with it. One, you can just wait. Some isotopes that are radioactive, uh, some of them can just decay on the order of days. And you do a discharge when radioactivity gets below a certain level. There's even tanks uh, called uh, the waste hold-up tank is one example. That's exactly what you do. You, it's, you hold it up in a tank, let it decay away, and then discharge it. Some of it is treated as well uh, and processed. There's the uh, advanced liquid uh, processing system, which Fukushima has. Uh, the nuclear power plant that I worked at has. It's fairly standard uh, for a nuclear power plant to have a way of processing that race. It's treated. It has been assessed by um, chemists at the plant and by uh, radiation protection personnel, and they evaluate it, and once it gets below a certain threshold, you can discharge it. And you can just discharge it out, and then it mixes in with, in the case of the plant I worked at, the circulating water system going out into the reservoir, but Fukushima is actually an even better case because they have a whole ocean to work with. The main contaminant in this water is tritium, a hydrogen yes. atom with two extra neutrons. It's a beta emitter with a half-life of around 12.3 years, created naturally when cosmic rays interact with Earth's atmosphere. It's a shame we don't have nuclear fusion reactors available. Tritium could actually be used in that. It's like, man, look at, look at all this tritium we got here. But alas, it's, it's just waste. So sad. It then circulates through the hydrological cycle, 
About 99% of all tritium, natural or man-made, is incorporated in water and follows the water cycle from the high atmosphere to the sea. Makes complete sense because water is so abundant here on Earth. The problem with it is that tritiated water is chemically identical to regular water, and so human bodies use it the same way. This brings up a good point, and one that I don't think I really talked about too much in some of my other videos. So nuclear reactions, including fission, uh, radioactive decay, they sort of ignore chemistry. Like the chemistry doesn't really matter because everything happens on a much closer range. So take boron, for instance. It has a property to absorb neutrons and slow down fission. In a pressurized water reactor that I worked at, boron can be incorporated in control rods where it's a solid, or it can be a liquid in the form of boric acid, which is kind of a liquid, think liquid control rods. You bore it, you inject boron into the reactor and it lowers reactor power, much like the control rods do. So it's another way of doing that. And a couple of reasons as to why you have both is one, redundancy, and two, they each one of them affects different parts of the reactor core because the control rods, since they go into the top of the core, they're gonna lower reactor power more at the top of the core locally, whereas the boron will go in and mix in with the bottom. So you use both to have a more even power distribution. It's nice to have both of those methods of control. The same is true with tritium as well. Doesn't matter if it's radioactive water or radioactive hydrogen gas. Beta radiation can't penetrate very far, but inhaled, absorbed, or ingested, as close to your vital organs as possible, tritium can be dangerous. The dangerous part specifically is um, increased uh, cancer risk from keeping the water within your body. Betas, like you said, are most hazardous internally. We're mostly water, so you have you put a whole bunch of that in you, well, you're gonna be at an increased risk of cancer. It would take a lot though. Thankfully, tritium is, relatively speaking, only dangerous in large concentrations and excreted from the body just like water. Yeah, because it's water. And so it's concentration that Fukushima will control and monitor after using highly technical water treatment methods to remove 62 much more harmful radioisotopes. Why not also just remove the tritium? Well, the multinucleide removal or ALPS process that Fukushima Daiichi is using to treat the contaminated water. He says ALPS, ALPS is what Advanced Liquid Processing System stands for. Can't remove all the tritium for the same reason your body takes it up like water. It's too chemically close to H2O, too hard to separate from the normal molecule. Because it is H2O. If you were to try to remove it, you'd have to use something like electrolysis, which for one is expensive, and two, you're gonna separate it out between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Radioactive water is a lot safer than radioactive hydrogen gas just because water is safer than hydrogen gas. The International Atomic Energy Agency has agreed with Japan on this point. The IAEA is, quote, not aware of any solution currently available for the separation of tritium commensurate with the concentration and the volume of yeah. treated water, end quote. In other words, if you had a process to separate out all this slightly different H2O, you would probably just still remove all of the H2O. Yeah, it would be like, what's the opposite of, in, opposite of enriching, deriching the water? I know you do enrich water for the uh, can-do nuclear plants, so they don't use tritium, they use deuterium, which is hydrogen with a proton and a neutron. And that's, that's how their reactors are designed in um, can-do reactors. Those are fascinating reactor types, by the way. Thousands and thousands of tons of radioactive water can't simply accumulate for the next four decades at Daiichi, especially considering the risk posed to the tanks by another possible earthquake and or tsunami. And so that's the other thing. There's a bigger risk of them sitting there versus, say, going out into the ocean where it'll be super diluted. And e I think it was an EPA quote or something, dilution being the solution to pollution. No different here. Starting just a few days ago, TEPCO will release treated water into the ocean via a one kilometer long undersea tunnel at an agreed upon concentration. Here, it will mix with seawater, which already contains a natural amount of tritium, diluting it to safe levels. At least, that's what TEPCO is claiming. 
<laughs> but the science is on their side. Dilution is deceptively powerful, and there's effectively an infinite amount of seawater. So again, the key factor here sure will be concentration, the amount of radiation per liter in the treated water. That concentration, according to TEPCO, will be 1,500 becquerels per liter, or water that decays in some way 1,500 times per second per liter. This is far below the regulatory levels for many other countries, as well as the World Health Organization's drinking water quality guidelines. So far below the levels in water discharge by many functioning power plants every year. France, TEPCO likes to point out, discharges 500 times more tritium into the ocean than Fukushima ever will. But that begs the question, how safe is this 1,500 becquerels per liter limit? 1,500 is a lot. That doesn't mean 1,500 is unsafe. Expect this level to be quite elevated because they had an accident compared to, say, a regular liquid waste discharge that can either be in preparation for an outage or even one at power. That's not unheard of to have a few liquid waste uh, discharges that was actually fairly routine. But again, we're talking very small amounts of radioactivity. Well, according to the math, very. If Fukushima's diluted seawater mix was drinkable, for example, you could drink two liters a day of it, direct from an undersea pipe, direct from a nuclear disaster, <laughs> and after a year, you still wouldn't have accumulated one-tenth of one percent of the dose that is agreed upon to cause negative health effects. So it's less dangerous to you than just drinking seawater by itself, because the whole, the, the whole salt will get you way before that. In fact, you wouldn't be able to physically consume enough of this treated water to irradiate you. You would drown before you got a dangerous dose. That 100 millisieverts per year, the number he's looking at, is that is the threshold for increased cancer risk. There were no cameras of any kind allowed at Fukushima Daiichi. That's normal. In case you're wondering why I haven't showed you pictures or visited a, a nuclear power plant, to give you any sort of footage, that's why. This is pretty standard. No camera, no photography inside an actual nuclear power plant. It has nothing to do with an accident, it's just, it's, it's a nuclear power plant. At least within the US, it's that way. The three hour tour started with a full briefing. We turned in our passports for copying tour, like and Zala. received about 80 pages of documents. Everything from timelines to medical reports to infographic filled explainers on tritium. <laughs> With the help of a translator, we went through a few of the pages relating to what we would soon see for ourselves. I wrote down notes in the margins. We were then asked to file into a theater in the visitor center. There, huh. we sat down for what could be only described as a long apology. On March 11, 2011, a severe accident occurred at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. We sincerely apologize to residents in Fukushima Prefecture and all people in society huh. for causing serious damage and having caused tremendous ongoing burden, anxiety, and inconvenience. After the apology was over, maybe some of that got lost in translation, but that's very, that's very different. The tour group was ushered onto a bus. A dosimeter with a large red readout flickered in one of the seats telling us the ambient dose rate inside of the vehicle. The bus tour began. We passed workers, some in regular clothes, others in full hazmat gear. This depends on how the radiation protection team at Fukushima surveyed the area. I can't say I know the status of it now, but if they're going into a radiological controlled area, they should have received a briefing on where the hazards are, where the dose is at its most, what areas are contaminated, what kind of protective personnel equipment, such as masks, uh, protective clothing, if they're going into a contaminated area. Note that protective clothing, that's not going to do you much in, against dose. What that will do, though, is if you're in a contaminated area, it's going to have you put them on and then take them off right before you leave so you don't spread contamination anywhere else while you're in the vicinity. Just because they have a dosimeter doesn't necessarily mean they're in a controlled area, but if they do, then it would be, then they would need some sort of briefing. But 
it's it's highly unusual to allow a tour of a radiological controlled area. I don't know how things are done in Japan, but if this was done in the United States um, and you have an exclusion zone, the exclusion zone is a radiological controlled area. So you would need to have clearance and briefing before entering. The TEPCO representative on board was proud of the fact that street clothes were now sufficient protection in the majority of the plant. We passed a street where purposefully and carefully maintained cherry blossom trees bloomed each year. We unfortunately had missed those by only a week or two. The dosimeter ticked up as we drove. As we got closer to the failed reactors, I had to turn my personal Geiger counter off. The alarm was blaring. This is when I started to get confused. At the start of the tour and before the bus ride, the ambient radiation wasn't anything to notice. And there's something to be said for that, for the efficacy of a decade of decontamination. But by the time we stopped at the husks of reactors one and two, I can confidently say that I've never stood in a place so radioactive. And I likely really? never will again. When I was just a stone's throw away from Chernobyl's sarcophagus, the decades-old fuel still produced a background rate of radiation of 20 microsieverts per hour. So within a stone's throw, so he must have been outside of the new safe confinement dome, so he couldn't actually like hit, he couldn't hit the elephant's th foot with the stone, so... Okay, I buy that, because that's a, that is a very low dose rate to be anywhere in the, uh, inside the Chernobyl sarcophagus, but if he's outside, that, that makes a little bit more sense. When I was more than a hundred meters away from Fukushima's decaying fuel, the radiation rate was more than 400% higher. 100 microsieverts per hour, that's actually not considered a high radiation area. The, high, the threshold for high radiation area is one millisievert per hour. And that's where the, the, the postings would have to say, so I'm, again, I'm talking in the U.S., would have to be posted and labeled high radiation area. This would still, this would just be radiation area based on that dose. But that's towards the upper end of a normal radiation area. But either way, you're going to need a briefing. Um, high radiation areas, if the dose was at that threshold. I've only done it a couple of times. I never had one of those sort of jobs. But the dosimeters, they put it on, you put one on your person, and sometimes the radiation protection staff would actually track where you are. So they could intervene if you get a sudden high dose alarm, like there's a spike, you, there's a, uh, if there's a, a hot spot that you happen to be next to. And again, all of this would be covered in the briefing. Just that little extra bit of protection so, they can so you can respond faster and get out. Now, I don't want to mislead you here. Even a higher than Chernobyl dose rate will not be dangerous if you follow the twin principles of Alara, as low a dose as reasonably achievable, yep, words to live and by. TDS, time, distance, shielding. As such, we didn't spend more than 15 minutes inside of Chernobyl's new safe confinement and were pressured for time by planned personnel. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is now I don't know about Kyle Hill and his team if they if they have a job that they're considered a radiation workers or not. I don't know his his background, but for a radiation worker, the limit is 50,000 microsieverts per year but it's only 1,000 for a non-radiation worker, at least within the United States. He could challenge that if he hangs out for a while, if he's not a radiation worker. But outside of Fukushima's ruined reactors is where we were told to get off the bus, necessarily minimizing shielding and distance. There we were lectured once more. Say minimizing maximizing shielding? Maximizing time. There was apparently enough time for a Q&A session. We even stopped to pose for a group photo. This short stop was the best example of the risk-reward calculation that the Japanese government and plant operator TEPCO were making. It is very good PR that members of the public can stand so close to the disaster that is only superseded by Chernobyl in infamy. But this stunt gave me a dose that was not as low as reasonably achievable. That's true, and this again underscores that in the U.S., you wouldn't have someone 
on a tour going and getting this kind of dose. This kind of dose is for radiation workers and in order to get in there you need special radiation worker training which i don't know if these guys if, if kyle hill and his teams have done that sort of training but even if they did they would need to do some level of plant specific training for fukushima it again if if this was in the u.s to even enter a radiological controlled area so this is this is very different this was bad radiation safety is the reward of good public perception greater than the small risk posed by a larger than necessary dose? It's very possible, but it's ethically complicated. We got back on the bus. And as long as all parties were aware of the risk and covered it during the briefing, because the briefing is an agreement by all parties to accept the risk and do the job the way it is. This wouldn't happen at my nuclear plant. Now this wouldn't happen at any plant within the US, but I'm not terribly surprised that this happened. Turned to the visitor center. The tour ended with a discussion of the tritiated water that would soon be released into the ocean. The finale was a large see-through plastic container of water, treated hmm. water, once held in one of the hundreds of storage tanks on site. We passed it around the room and examined it closely. As we did, a plant employee explained how tritiated water would meet international safety requirements before ocean release, and how a release of this kind is actually standard operation for all nuclear power plants. True. Again, this was good PR for the immense reputational damage done to TEPCO. This is the water you're so scared of. Hold it. Look at it. See? Nothing to worry about. But again, for anyone who knows anything about radiation, this presentation was confusing. Irradiated water doesn't look like anything. It's not muddy. Right. It doesn't glow like a nuclear reactor. Keep in mind, he's talking about the Sarenkov glow that you can see that you can see in an actual uh, reactor core. It's blue. We're not talking about any goofy green glow. <laughs> could have handed us dangerously contaminated water, and it would have looked exactly the same. We could have held personal Geiger counters up to it. And we did, and nothing would have clicked, because beta radiation doesn't make it through thick plastic like that in the first place. That's true. Another thing is when you're just holding to see it, yet yeah, it doesn't look like anything, but even if it did, you would be, you would be safe from it. It's, some, it's like putting him a sample of oil. Yes, it's safe for you to hold it, but you don't want to drink the stuff. That is a little weird. It was a great hands-on visual, but ultimately, slightly misleading. Risk, reward. As a they were probably trying to show it for the layperson that doesn't know because some people are picturing nasty green stuff. I've actually seen it happen at the circulating water, so we're not even talking the nuclear uh, portion of the plant, where there was actually a bunch of green stuff in there. Well, that was an algae bloom. But if someone from the press were to take a picture of it, they'd probably be like, ah, nasty radioactive water, and no. <laughs> Public communicator myself, I completely agree that standing in front of ruined reactors and handling canisters of treated water are powerful experiences that can say a lot and could change public opinion. Sure. But as a scientist, I don't agree with unnecessarily putting people in probably the hottest environment they'll ever be in for an unnecessary amount of time. And as an engineer, I can agree. That's typ typical uh, safety engineering principles. And he already talked about them, Alara and time distance shielding. That's, those are things to live by. Those are, those are actually all bullet points in a pre-job briefing checklist, how you maintain Alara. Well, to every pre-job brief checklist, even ones that don't involve working in a radiological environment at a, at a nuclear power plant. That's how serious it's taken there. So this, this does strike me as weird too. And keep in mind, they didn't tell us the background rates there beforehand. I'm sorry, what? Okay, this, uh, hmm. So I don't know the facts of Kyle Hill's visit, so I'm not going to make any accusations because this, this isn't the entire story, but... That is the first thing you talk about in a proper radiological brief is what the dose rate is. Alara, time distance shielding doesn't mean anything if you don't know where the hazard is, how much is it, and how long you're going to be there. Those are all very, 
very key questions you need to learn before you even get to the pre-job brief. When you're into the um, the appraise st uh, phase of the project, saying, "Hmm, I wonder if this is a good idea at all," then you, those are things that need to be considered. But in every radiological briefing, and even if it's not, a, it doesn't have to be a high radiation area. It could be. It could be zero, you could be in a radiological controlled area and expect to get zero dose. But knowing that you expect to get zero dose is normal. So you need to know what the dose rate is, what the contamination is, a survey map showing you the last time it ha the area has been surveyed, which will tell you where the hot spots are, whether or not it's contaminated, what sort of personnel protective equipment you need to wear if the area is contaminated, as well as certain things to minimize the dose. That's where the, the shielding would, would come in, depending on your source of radiation. But that's what you need at, at a minimum to have an adequate brief for working, or not even working, a, a touring or a walk down in any radiological controlled area. If I had known, I probably would have stayed on the bus where I could still easily see the reactors. Yeah. Nor do I understand using a canister of what could have been tap water to highlight their decontamination efforts. Visiting an experiment like the one that was done with two population of flounder in both seawater and treated seawater would have been far more powerful, just as visual and not as misleading. Maybe these are the risks that are necessary and needed for TEPCO specifically in Japan generally to overcome what is undoubtedly the worst public image for any industry ever. No risk is ever worth not having a good radiological briefing. I don't care what you're doing. To perform life-saving operations in a nuclear power plant attempting to avert an accident requires a briefing. It's a simple briefing and a very quick one designed to be performed by professionals, but it is a briefing and there is a sheet, there is an expedited sheet for that. Because that's the other thing. Not knowing what the dose is, okay, 400 microsieverts per hour. We'll use that as an example. Well, is that what was forecast? And it's like, actually we forecasted 500 microsieverts per hour. So it being a little less than that is, is good. But if the forecast was only 100 microsieverts per hour and they're picking up 400, that tells you something's wrong. That's another reason why you have the brief. You discuss contingencies and what to do if things go wrong. Simulations show that as treated water makes its way back to the ocean, any increase in radiation will be localized to the coast, and those increased doses pose no real physical risk to the wildlife or to the public. The tritiated water will be monitored before, during, and after it meets the ocean, a process that could take as long as the decommissioning of the power plant itself, 30 to 40 years. As I said, I have no re decommissioning does take a while. That's one of the reasons why I, I even had a few of my coworkers were like, "Hey, if if they shut us down, we're not losing our jobs anytime soon." If you have a job that critically in interfaces with the reactor, such as say a reactor operator, for instance, or a uh, chemistry technician, nah, you got plenty of work to do after they decide to shut you down permanently. They never actually experienced a shutdown, by the way. The total amount of tritium held in Fukushima's water tanks is less than three grams. Negligible. I remember having these late night discussions on back shift with the uh, duty uh, radiation protection manager, and we would often say things about, hey, and in the case of tritium, we're protecting the environment from the environment. However, is this plan being presented to the public in some unhelpful and slightly misleading ways? Also, yes. And that has real consequences. China, for example, has already imposed a preemptive blanket ban on all Japanese seafood, which will have huge economic effects. Yeah. Environmentalist groups are stoking fe fears by saying that the plan is like, quote, diluting whiskey and coke both fundamentally misunderstanding what concentration is and what alcohol by volume means. <laughs> I don't get that analogy at all. I wouldn't call what is happening at Fukushima a PR disaster, like Three Mile Island was, but I wouldn't call it the nuclear industry's first PR success either. There are no easy answers here. We'll see if that changes, and I hope that it does.
they have the next 40 years to get it right. You want to know what the nuclear industry's biggest PR success is? Silence. That is when you are successful in the nuclear industry in the eyes of the public. Not a word happens. You're steaming and dreaming, as they say, producing power. Building new nuclear power plants is nice, too. But silence is golden in the nuclear power industry. As far as how I feel about the whole risk-reward thing, that, I mean, it's, it's a cost just like when you weigh everything, though. If people are willing to uh, take that risk of heading to a nuclear power plant, even one... Post accident, let's let's even say this hypothetically. This was much worse than the numbers that Kyle actually showed. Then you just have to make a risk benefit analysis like you do in any other situation. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.